neuroleptic malignant syndrome uh, versus malignant hyperthermia is the topic for uh, this uh, video. These two uh, uh, conditions uh, can present in a way that they look or sound very similar, but there are some differences and that's what we're going to talk about today. So the first one, uh, what we'll start with is uh, NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and we'll get into that. So what is this? Well, well first of all, uh, I think that initially it's best to describe the symptoms. It's something that occurs after a person takes a medication. So you can kind of think of it as a severe uh, side effect uh, to medications. Which medications? Well, there's two types. The first is antipsychotics, and the second is uh, antiemetics, um, uh, medications given for nausea. And I'll list uh, which ones um, a little later on. So a typical scenario is someone is given an antipsychotic or an antiemetic, and uh, maybe a few days later, uh, they develop severe side effects, and those severe side effects are as follows. The first uh, severe side effect, uh, part of the symptomatology, is altered mental status, AMS. The person is lethargic or unresponsive. The next one is something that involves motor abnormalities, and in particular, muscle rigidity. So remember this. This will be in probably every single clinical vignette that's ever been created about neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This uh, muscle rigidity is actually pretty severe. The next uh, uh, component of the symptomatology is in extremely high temperature hyperthermia, often greater than 40 uh, degrees uh, Celsius. And then the fourth and final component of the symptomatology is um, involving uh, hyperactivity uh, of the autonomic uh, system. So that uh, refers to tachycardia uh, and tachypnea. So we've got uh, increased in respiratory rate and increased in heart rate. So which ones? Which medications cause um, these uh, side effects or can cause? Well, there's a big long list, but what I'm going to do is, is list the ones that are most commonly uh, tested. So for antipsychotics, the most commonly tested is haloperidol. Haldol, haloperidol, also known as haldol. Um, there's another one, chlorpromazine. That's also uh, listed uh, or tested. Thyridazine. All right. Um, there's atypical uh, antipsychotics as well, like clozapine and uh, risperidone that can also be involved. But by far, this is the most commonly. Antiemetics, which ones? Well, metoclopramide and promethazine. Promethazine is uh, very commonly used uh, antiemetic, and then also prochlorperazine. So... This is a, a list of some of the most commonly uh, tested medications that cause NMS. All right, so how do you diagnose it? Well, the diagnosis really is just clinical, but some uh, diagnostic tests can be ordered, like a CMP, urine tests as well to check for uh, myoglobin, um, muscle breakdown products. But really, a lot of this testing is really just... Uh, to confirm if it's not something else, but most of the time it's just based on clinical and uh, history. Now the treatment is the probably the most important uh, point in terms of uh, testing. The uh, treatment is really a supportive treatment and it involves three things. The first uh, thing is that you need to control the hyperthermia and the hyperthermia is controlled with a drug called uh, dantrolene. Now, uh, the person will also be very agitated, and the agitation is controlled with benzodiazepines. And finally, the uh, most important part of this uh, pathophysiology is uh, dopamine. 
because if you remember those antipsychotics that can cause this work by lowering the dopamine levels so what you do uh, to reverse that is increase is give a medication to increase the dopamine levels in the brain so you give a dopamine agonist as part of the treatment and which dopamine agonist do you give it's probably the most famous one which is bromocryptine okay so this one uh, is taking care of the neurotransmitter this one is for the agitation and this medication dantrolene is given to uh, control the hyperthermia so the, the, this is the way it's uh, treated it's pretty severe so it's usually treated in the ICU alright now that we ran through neuroleptic malignant syndrome let's turn our attention now to malignant hyperthermia and it will uh, appear like I'm talking about the same thing but there are some differences and those are the differences that you need to uh, concentrate on um, in order to figure out what the clinical vignette is referring to alright so what's malignant hyperthermia well again it's uh, you can kinda of think of it as a side effect or a reaction to medication which medication well, it's not uh, the medications we talked about with NMS. Different medications. And which one? In particular, two types. The first one is a muscle relaxant. And the second type is a anesthetic. And I'll just talk, tell you which ones. So that you don't have to wait. Halothane. Halothane is the uh, anesthetic. And I would like to write here that it's not just any anesthetic, it's an inhalation anesthetic. Inhalation. And the muscle relaxant is su succinylcholine. Alright, so remember those. Halothane, succinylcholine, a muscle relaxant, and an inhal inhalation anesthetic are the causative medications for malignant hyperthermia so what happens what what kind of uh, side effects or, or symptoms do they produce in the patient well very similarly you have muscle rigidity hyperthermia again and um, um, there's others there's very similar tachycardia um, so it do you see how similar it is to NMS? And that's why it's important to uh, learn the subtle differences. Um, and they can. this can also uh, lead to rhabdomyolysis, uh, which is a muscle breakdown. All right. So one thing, uh, before I move forward with uh, diagnosis and treatment, uh, it's very important with uh, malignant hyperthermia is uh, sometimes uh, clinical vignettes uh, will talk about mechanism of action so we discussed that the uh, anesthesia uh, medications can cause this in particular halothane but how what's going on well the mechanism is that the anesthetic induces calcium uh, to be released from the uh, skeletal muscle it's calcium release so you can kind of think as this is causing calcium to release from skeletal muscle and um, uh, in particular the sarcoplasmic reticulum that's something you probably haven't heard since biology class but uh, that's the actual uh, full definition of what's happening so what, what why is this important well what this does is it accelerates muscle contractions we all know that calcium is involved in muscle contractions and that's why you get that rigidity and the calcium can also cause an elevation in the heart rate and that's why you get the tachycardia so this is important remember that all right so we've got a patient uh, again um, the uh, diagnosis is really again uh, clinical uh, 
uh, you kind of ta- uh, have to look at what the, what's been happening in terms of symptomatology and history. Most commonly, a person who has had inhalation anesthesia with halothane, and then several hours later develops this rigidity and tachycardia. But there's several other tests that are done um, uh, just to kind of uh, be complete in the workup. Again, very similar to NMS, urine for myoglobin to kind of um, rule out anything else. But it's really a, a, a pretty uh, clinical diagnosis uh, that involves the history as well. So then how do you treat it? Well, very similarly um, to NMS, uh, really you have to treat the hyperthermia because it can sometimes be uh, very, very high, up to 43 uh, degrees Celsius. And then you also want to manage the agitation. Uh, but there's no uh, dopamine involved in this. So remember, the NMS treatment involved dopamine. There isn't in this one. So hypothermia is, again, treated with dantrolene. Agitation is treated with benzodiazepines. And um, you uh, want to uh, basically give the patient supportive uh, type of treatment, uh, and usually maybe in the ICU, um, it's because there's a very high mortality associated with malignant hyperthermia as with uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So most of the time in, in, it's in an ICU management. Uh, one final thing I'd like to mention is uh, you remember halothane that causes uh, these is inhalation. So if a person is uh, susceptible to developing malignant hyperthermia, it's probably best not to give inhalation anesthesia if they're going in for surgery. Probably want to give local or regional anesthesia if possible. All right. So now I have a couple of vignettes and uh, hopefully this can shed some light on how to approach these questions. All right, here we go. 27-year-old woman with a history of paranoid schizophrenia is brought by a friend to the hospital. The woman had been an inpatient at a psychiatric hospital. For several months after being discharged, she had been maintained on haloperidol. Shots. For the past couple of days, after the last injection, she appeared strange. She is stiff, cannot swallow or talk, and appears tremulous. The friend is concerned that she has some kind of infection since she has a fever. On examination, her temperature is 38. Uh, blood pressure is 157 over 104. Pulse is 122. Respirations are 24. She has increased tone in her neck and extremities, appears tremulous, diaphoretic, and confused. A leukocyte count is 19,600. And serum creatinine phosphokinase is markedly elevated. Workup for infection is negative. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Well, she was on haloperidol. That is a antipsychotic. So remember, which one was it? Is it NMS or malignant hyperthermia? Well, antipsychotics are responsible for neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And everything else we talked about is there. You remember the four components of the symptomatology, altered mental status, that's there, she's confused. Uh, the r- mus- muscle rigidity, increased tone, that's there. The hyperthermia, uh, not as dramatic as we talked about, but it's still there. And then the tachycardia is there also, tachypnea and tachycardia. So her respirations are uh, showing tachypnea and her heart rate is t- showing tachycardia. So the one clinical vignette encompasses all the symptomatology of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So the answer to this is D. All right. And then the final one. A 28-year-old woman is undergoing surgery and is anesthetized with an inhalant anesthetic. She is also given an IV dose of succinylcholine. All right, both. Within minutes, she develops a heart rate of 124 and increasing core body temperature. What is the mechanism of action of the drug of choice for this patient's condition? Okay, well, that's 
that's usually not what we're asked, right? Well, th I, I particularly chose this question because I wanted to talk a little bit about first, second, and third order questions. Increasingly, on especially North American licensing exams, questions tend to be much more difficult. They're not just first order. First order is where you ask a question in the form of a clinical vignette, and the answer is just very straightforward, uh, meaning they, they're they describing a disease, they ask you what's the disease, what's the diagnosis. But second order is when you have to think one step further, and the third order is one step further even after second order. So for example, this question, the first order of this question is to determine what's the diagnosis. Well, we talked about that um, inhalation anesthetics, in particular halophane and succinylcholine, can produce a symptom or a diagnosis called malignant hyperthermia, M malignant hyperthermia, MH. And that involves muscle rigidity and uh, tachycardia and tachypnea and, and hyperthermia. And so that's what this patient has. So that's the first order of the question. The second order is uh, right here, the drug of choice. How do you treat this? Well, the drug of choice, we talked about it, was dantrolene. Now, this question goes even one step further. It doesn't even ask you what is the drug of choice. It asks you what's the mechanism of action of the drug of choice. Well, do you remember how dantrolene works? Well, do you remember what's happening in malignant hyperthermia? Is that calcium is being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum of the skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle. Dantrolene reverses that. So the mechanism of action, MOA, of dantrolene is that it interferes with the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is a classic third order question. 